On today's show, we're talking all things creators with Nathan Barry, founder of ConvertKit and host of the Billion Dollar Creator Podcast. We're going to talk middle class creators, how you can have a mid-size audience and make a ton of money, especially in B2B niches. This is something nobody's talking about, and Nathan is breaking it down. And you're going to want to stick around to the very end where Nathan gives you his three must-dos for anyone who wants to be a creator. I'm your co-host, Kip Bodner, Chief Marketing Officer at HubSpot. I'm joined by my co-host, Kieran Flanagan, who's the Chief Marketing Officer at Zapier. And this is Marketing Against the Grain. Let's get into today's show. Nathan, welcome to Marketing Against the Grain. Yeah, thanks for having me on. So one of the reasons we're really excited to have you on is because on our show, we talk a lot about creators and the creator first economy. And, you know, Kieran and I are bullish on creators, but like, where do you stand? Is that a good bet? You're still going down that route. What's the pros and the cons of the state of the the creator movement today? So the the first thing is, don't write it because it's a hot wave. It'll change and, and your company will die out because of it. Like the, the 2021 vintage <laughs> of like hot creator companies, I think most of them are going to die out. But then the other thing is, I think the creator economy overall is absolutely massive and going to thrive. And, you know, I think it'll be five, like five years from now, I think it'll be two to five times bigger than it is now. The thing that we've seen, Nathan, is like a lot of these channels that you can grow from today favor creators versus a a brand, right? Like if you look at the social channels, they for the most part want creators because they have all these creator programs. They don't even allow brands to, you know, have their links on those platforms. They want to monetize on the platform that favors creators. So we've kind of seen this evolution of like all these channels start to kind of favor the individual versus the brand. I'm curious if you've seen that how do you see that? Or do you see that trend yourself? I absolutely see it. And it's not because the platform favors a an individual creator over a brand. It's because the consumers do it. And so the mm. platforms are watching that consumer behavior and then following it, right? Everything that, right. that the platforms are doing is to try to increase, you know, watch time, views on advertising and that sort of thing. And so you need attention from a from an audience. And so they're saying, okay, what works? If we have, you know, random... I don't know what professional services company as their brand talking about here are seven ways that you should be ready for taxes this season or whatever the product is, right? (laughs) They're seeing that content. And then they're seeing, you know, the CPA who's saying, Hey, here's what I'm actually seeing as I'm, you know, four things that I noticed last week because I was helping clients. Like, here's what you should watch for in your business. There is going to be a night and day difference in engagement from consumers on that. And so Again, it's not that the the platform is like, this is what we want to exist in the world. The platform is just like, look, this is what where attention consumers is going. Want. They're trying to match their content with what their consumer wants. And consumers, for the most part, are attracted towards an individual f- versus a brand. And these channels actually allow individuals to be much more front and center. I think the, that would be, to me, like the bullish case on the creator. If, like, if I had to sit down and say, what's the bullish? It's like, well, the consumer wants to like interact with individuals. Today, it's easier than ever for an individual to get like front and center mm-hmm. in all these channels with that person versus, so maybe it's not like creator versus a brand or person versus a brand, but like just it's easier for a person with something to say to get in front of those people. And that's what consumers gravitate towards. The bearish case I've always had on just like creators in general and like anyone who wants to become a creator is like where there's this like small subset of winners and everyone else is like, losers and there's like no there's like such a huge separation between those two things so actually there's a whole mid tail or like middle category where you can actually be successful creator where you don't have to be the mr beast or any of these kind of top echelon is that always been that way or that's a new thing you've seen i think it's always been that way it's just not the sexy exciting thing to talk about Right. right. Well, it's also not anybody's mindset, Nathan. I think when people start out, they think they have to get really big and and getting really big takes a long, long time. And most people just can't do the grind. M- most people who are diving in are not going to see meaningful results in one to two years, especially if they don't have the habits required to show up consistently. If you're already a professional in your industry, you know how to show up, you know how to write, you know, you know how to produce content and you decide I'm going to be a creator, then like totally you can get it in one to two years. But if you're if you're coming in cold, you know, saying like, I have this unrelated skill that I want to teach as a creator and you don't already know how to get like the perfect Zoom set up and, you know, you're not struggling over what podcasting mic to use, then then you're going to have much different results. But the popular narrative of this power law 
It's just because people don't want to pay attention to, or they don't have the data for the the mid tier, because it's not what's getting written about. But I can see it, right? I see it firsthand. I have fifty thousand customers paying for ConvertKit, and we collect all of the revenue data from every platform that they sell on, and that, you know, that customer that has between, I'll call it five thousand and a hundred thousand email subscribers, they're absolutely printing money relative to their audience size. Mm. And the thing is, is because they can, I mean, I know you both are huge fans of email marketing. <laughs> you wouldn't work, you know, where you have in your yeah. careers if you didn't believe in it. But being able to personalize messages to your audience, being able to segment and target, right? Like you can monetize in a huge way. Like here's an example. There's a creator named Ali Abdal. He has a fantastic YouTube channel, podcast, all that. But the YouTube channel is the main thing. And he's grown a big audience on email. He did a YouTube course that did very, very well. Before I sh share the numbers, let me do a counter argument. There's another channel called Yes Theory. They are maybe five to 10 times as popular as Ollie is. They came out with a course and they, I, like it totally flopped. They're teaching a course on like, here's how to do YouTube. Totally flopped, giant audience. Ollie Abdal comes out with his course. It's making three to $4 million a year. Now, Ollie is a power law creator, right? Yeah, he's, he's, he's big, yeah. but yes, theory is incredibly larger. And so when you dive in on this, and you're like, wait a second, why is the small creator printing money and the large creator has this big flop with their audience? And the thing is that Ollie did not promote his course on his YouTube channel. He used his YouTube channel as top of funnel. He got them into an email list. He then segmented people based on what they're interested in. He taught a bunch about here's how to start a YouTube channel. Here's what to do found this like, you know, you call it a niche of people who want to learn on YouTube, but it's, it was probably 5,000 people, you know, <laughs> it was a lot of people. And then he sold a high priced course to them that was really good and really targeted. And he made millions of dollars. And so that's happening at smaller scales where the a creator's like, hey, I have 100,000 on Instagram and I can't sell a thing. But then they're going down and targeting and finding the right thing for the right people to a subset, you know, 10,000 people on an email list where they can segment and tag and personalize and everything else. And they're just printing money. And so all of these creators who are like, there's no middle class, it's like you're right. There's no middle class on those platforms. But if you bring those people mm -hmm. to email, yeah. there's a thriving middle class. Okay, so, so what, are, what are the things if you're watching and you are like, hey, I, I want to have at least some type of personal revenue coming from a creator is you have, Nathan, I think what you're telling everybody is like, you need to decide what your top of the funnel is. And that's probably some combination of YouTube or Instagram or TikTok. And then you have some kind of mid funnel where you're going to actually monetize. And, and historically you're saying from all the data you see across 50,000 creators, that's email and podcasts. Is that what you're seeing? Yeah. So you got to think of it like a hub and spoke model. A lot of creators try to be on every platform and that doesn't work because you're going to spread yourself then. Or they'll go, oh, okay, I'm only going to focus on email because that is where I get the best engagement. But there's a huge problem. Like email does not have a discovery algorithm. It doesn't no. exist, right? Like I promise you, I've looked for a long time. <laughs> yeah. so, to be yes, clear, I think I promise. have figured that out, but we'll, we'll come back to that in a second. Okay, please. So email is where you get the best engagement, but there's no algorithm that's going to like, if you have the best email, it's like, wow, okay, that's now trending on the email homepage. Like it, that's not a thing. Whereas a really great Twitter thread, you know, could legitimately be viewed by, you know, 5 million people, right? LinkedIn, all these other platforms, Instagram, TikTok, et cetera, right? YouTube, their whole thing is discovery algorithms. And so I, I think the most successful creators choose one social platform that they feel the best at and are most confident in. They have a second that they're testing, that they're playing with, and then they are driving all of that to email. So a common thing is you'll see YouTube as a primary Instagram as a secondary, email as the hub. Or if you're focused on written content, Twitter is the primary and LinkedIn as the secondary and the email hub. And I've seen some massive, massive businesses. You've seen people do that and capture email addresses off those two platforms because I've seen like anytime you promote on those platforms these days, that stuff just doesn't do as well. Like the, those, all, every platform seems to want to build like an in-app experience where they you know you see tiktok right like tiktok shops are incredible and they're incredible because the experience is within the same platform and even google search one of the last places which its whole entire 
goal was to get you somewhere else is moving towards, no, like you can't leave, stay here. We'll give you all the answers. And I think AI chat is going to make that much worse. But I'm definitely surprised to hear that like creators have been able to go from X and LinkedIn and build a great subscriber list of that because I haven't seen, I've never really seen it work where you promote anything on these channels and at scale, you can get people to sign up for something. So I think that's interesting. And I'd love to kind of just hear about how that's been working. Yeah, I see it work firsthand all the time. I was just on a call yesterday with six or seven creators who were talking about how they've built their audiences on X and LinkedIn. And if you put a link in your initial post, it's often going to not get the distribution that it would otherwise. Right. So you'll see people do something like, if I post something and it gets at least 200 likes and it has this momentum, then I will reply with a lead magnet. You know, basically the, the traditional playbook that's worked for so long. It still works today. So the, the only difference is that you're generally not going straight to sharing a link. You're providing a bunch of value on the platform and following up with a link to get more. It's like the guest posting strategy where you're not just saying, hey, go, you know, jump over here to get my free guide to whatever topic. You have to provide a ton of value in the guest post, right? And then, you know, say, hey, if you want to go deeper on product launches, the thing is, right. jump off here. But the exact same strategies that have worked before always work. They, there's just some very s small tweaks on them. The other thing is knowing that these algorithms are not going to show all your content to everyone. And so effective content creators are going to post pretty often. And then like there's a, a creator named Nick Huber who, yep. man, here's someone. He's, he's, su he's such a troll on Twitter. It's hilarious. His whole uh, content strategy is to just elicit engagement through any means possible, right? Well, so he has a very oh, deliberate he's... content strategy. He's yeah. a little less trolling than he used to be. He's also completely different in real life, which I believe I that. find I've, wildly I've entertaining. But he is one of those people. He's not a power law distribution creator, right, from an audience size, but he is absolutely printing money. And so if you look at what he's doing, he has these top of funnel posts on Twitter and LinkedIn primarily, where he is just trying to get views and attention, right? And so he'll post something about, you know, an HOA or right in his space and people like, it just gets people fired up. He'll yeah, say, he does a bunch of crazy real estate. Say stuff, something yeah. inflammatory, right? And it'll go from there. Now, down from there, he'll have like meaningful business content as his like mid-level funnel where he's talking about, hey, this is what's working in my business. Here's some actual numbers. You know, here's a strategy you should implement. And then at the very bottom of the funnel, he's got some very detailed niche content, right? And this is all posted to, to uh, Twitter. But when you look at it, like I learned more about bonus depreciation as a real estate tax strategy from a thread that he wrote where I was like, <laughs> I did not understand how that works. You know, no CPA's article is going to get me to understand that. But then he explains it. And so the way that he thinks about it is top of funnel, just tracked views, mid funnel, that content is focused on getting, you know, like demonstrating some of the expertise, educating, building that with a smaller group. And then bottom of the funnel is to demonstrate that he is like a world-class expert at all of this. And then do you want to be a customer of one of his companies, co-invest with him in one of his funds on from there? And that's it. Like that audience is worth $5 million a year or more. There's actually a perfect description of that and why I think creators often beat brands because the way you describe top of the funnel, middle funnel, and then monetization, that top funnel part you have to be okay with people not, not reacting very well. But like what brands often do is because they're so fearful of having people, you know, really say bad things about them. That mid funnel piece is their top funnel piece. Right. And that's why, that's actually why creators outperform brands in most of modern day channels is because no one wants the mid funnel stuff in those creator awareness channels. It's boring. And people are just like looking for something to really react to, either violently disagree with or violently uh, agree with and that's just not comfortable that's not a comfortable place for a brand to live well, right they well, don't like living in that place Kieran let me let me try something on but for both of you because we're talking about the creator business and obviously Nathan is like hey I think it's hard to build a really high value venture backed creator focused business but man I think over the next decade the creator economy is going to be huge well I think the reason for that that none of us nobody talks enough about is especially in the B2B landscape, these B2B creators are disrupting all of these old school niche media and training organizations, right? 
like these really obscure private equity rolled up media companies that have 30, 30, 40 different little like niche magazines and newsletters across different things. And idiots like me were always like, oh, brands are going to disrupt those publications, those training, training things, because those companies, they're kind of boring. They're stodgy. They have this host of kind of like average writers and you kind of don't know who's behind it. And brands have the authority. They can tell the story. And then what we're actually saying is, well, brands can't disrupt because they can't actually do the provocation, the point, of, the extreme point of view, the kind of top 25% that is necessary to be relevant in a market that is very dynamic and changing more than ever before. And so creators are going to step in and fill that void. And all that money that was being spent across all these media companies, all of these training companies, which... By the way, they're also small. Nobody's really rolling up. I went if we, I bet if we went and sized it, it's a massive, like, you know, it's probably a 20 to $30 billion market. Like, that's what's happening. I, I think it's absolutely happening that the not only is the attention going to a different place than it was before, but also it's just, it's way more effective. Right? As we talked earlier to market as an individual than as a brand. I disagree with the premise that you have to be inflammatory or that that even necessarily works the best, right? And so that a a creator is saying things different than what a brand could say. Because there's all of these creators that like are only entirely positive and are even more successful. Like in the same industry, right? If you look at Sahil Bloom on on Twitter and LinkedIn, yeah. He only says super positive things and he's got a million followers and his business is doing insanely well. So then Nathan, can we do the before and after? What is the void creators are filling that brands are having a hard time filling? And if you're a brand and you want to be more like a creator, do these things. If you're a creator and you want to be successful, do these things. Like you work with the best creators in the world. Like you have more insight into this than anybody else. Like what's what's kind of the the before after or or the kind of the difference between those two buckets of people who are out there trying to capture influence? Well, I think the first thing is use creators and like elevate people within your brand, right? This is something that HubSpot has done really, really well, both in, you know, your own content, but then also like with the HubSpot podcast network and, and all of that, where you're really able to have creators show up in a way, right? There are individuals that I can follow. With ConvertKit, we bo- do that both with, you know, our content, right? My, what I'm, what I'm creating, what like Charlie Prangley, our creative director, she's got 250,000 subscribers on YouTube, right? She is really well known in the design space when she comes out and talks about like, here's how I use ConvertKit. Here's any of those things, right? It gets a ton of traffic and attention. So both do it with, you know, your internal employees and then also do it with your customers, right? Get creators who, you know, in our case, our customers are creators. So this is easier, Yeah, right? I have a, a coffee table book here that is, all of these stories of creators that we've told, right? This is how creators are using our product. And you see that more and more where brands will deliberately hire creators and say, hey, you're the the front person for this. Or here's the network of creators that are the front person. There was an education startup um, that I saw who deliberately hired someone who was already growing on Twitter and Instagram related to um, you know, alternative education and and all of that. And they're like, okay, you know, <laughs> we're now paying you, I don't know what, but say it's $100,000 a year, 150000 a year, if you're hiring someone who's like growing in their career, not like at the very, very top. And then you basically as a brand, it's not that you like through your brand account, try to t- copy what works as a creator. You just hire creators <laughs> and go from there. Yeah. <laughs> a Notion exactly. is a great yeah. company, right? You look at all of this content if you, if you go on TikTok and Instagram and YouTube and search Notion content, right? There, are, I think there are like over 100 million views on TikTok for the hashtag Notion. Or if it's not that high, it's pretty close. And you that's might crazy. think, oh, that's just, just because of their product, right? That's just how, how it works. No, no, no. It is carefully engineered behind the scenes. There's this guy, Ben, who is, I think, one of the best in the world at, at this. I wouldn't be surprised if you two both know him. And he has like his creator and influencer program where he's working. He's not working with the biggest creators. He's working with ones who are even super small, creating great content. Yeah. And he's building long-term relationships with them. He's, you know, paying for a lot of content. And then people see, you know, another creator is like, wow, 
this creator made Notion content and did really well. I think I will do the same. And so that builds it up. Whereas the first creator got paid to produce it, right? And so those kind of flywheels that you build work really, really well. And it's basically brands working with creators rather than just trying to copy the best practices. What about aqua hiring creators, basically having those people internal to your team versus- like, But also buying like, the IP is basically what you're saying. Instead of hiring them, also like buy the- I don't the know about the IP. I actually just think like- well, that's what I an aqua hire would be. Yeah, I know, but I you have to, the way, so I think there's two versions of that. There's one where the IP is something worthwhile, like actually something meaningful to you, has enough volume or something that it's actually useful to you. I don't know if there's a lot of creators when you are a brand, like if that is true, like the thing that they have is a thing that's really going to be meaningful to your business, but they themselves, like if they can bring that in and do something, some version of that bigger and better and you get them more resources, like it's at, at the end of the day, it's a pretty expensive hire, but you end up overpaying because you think it's a unique person to work within your company who can kickstart something. But the problem with only working through creators, you don't build any of that talent internally. Mm -hmm. You're continually dependent upon external people to like be, a, you know, they kind of represent your brand in some ways. Yeah, I think that you either need to work with a network of creators where you're not reliant on a single person, right? Because if you build your entire brand around one person who, you know, is not a co-founder, does not have substantial equity, then that that could be a single point of failure. The aqua hire thing is really interesting to me because the question that I like to ask is for any given bit of attention, what's the highest ROI place you could direct them? Mm. Mm. And so a good creators are the absolute best in the world at getting attention, right? Like a, a million views, 10 million, you know, it's like we are so good at it. And on one hand, creators monetize really, really well, where you're talking about someone who is in, you know, maybe a small niche. They could be teaching writing, which maybe historically is a $60,000 a year job like somewhere in the United States. And now here they are making $600,000 a year mm. because they have this course that's doing really well, maybe have sponsorships in their newsletter, any of those things. So, you know, I'm looking at this person who like say has 50,000 people on their email list and is making $600,000 a year. And we're like, wow, they have that attention and they're monetizing really, really well. Like that's amazing. On the other hand, I think creators are the worst at monetization. And the reason is because they're creating something that's so much more valuable. Have you guys ever had it where you're, you're bidding on keywords or something like in, in Google search results and oh, yeah. someone is outbidding oh, yeah. you and you can't figure out how they can pay as much? Yes. And it's normally because they're losing money. <laughs> well, <laughs> often they're, they're losing money. Yeah. yeah. But often there's something going on downstream, like Higher down in their points. funnel that yes. they're doing that you're not, right? There's an upsell somewhere in there. Their, their churn is way better than yours is. And so this is the same thing with creators where a certain audience to a creator is worth whatever amount of money. Let's use the writing course example. I'm selling a writing course for $1,000, right? In my, my attention to paid product funnel, I basically cap out at $1,000. If we go a different direction, we sell a different kind of product, right? That attention might be worth way more to a brand. So now you have these creators who are saying like, hold on, how could I monetize this attention to the best possible way? I'll give you an example. There's a blog, Mark's Daily Apple. It's a like health and wellness blog written by Mark Sisson. In 2013 to 2015, he's got 100 to 150,000 subscribers. He's making one to $2 million a year. Combination of ad sales, affiliate revenue, and some of his own digital products. Great monetization, wildly successful, you know, in like the paleo health diet recipe space. Great win. My question is, when you look at that audience, is that the best monetization? 150,000 subscribers, one to $2 million a year. Looks great. But what else could you do with that? What he did, I think, is absolutely fascinating. Where he said, okay, what does my audience truly want? Yes, there's recipes. Yes, there's tips. But what if they could just buy the product, right? And so everyone's saying like, hey, this paleo-friendly salad dressing, thanks for the recipe, but it's kind of a pain in the ass to make. Can I just buy it? And so he goes and starts a company doing that. He you know, effectively like hits his minimum order quantities and all of this off of his audience. He can sell all the, the first, first units. He can get distribution in grocery stores because when he talks to a buyer, right, say Whole Foods, they're like, hey, we're going we're gonna to test this out. We're going to put it in a couple stores, see how it goes. If it does well, we'll roll it out, you know, uh, regionally and then maybe nationwide. And he can go, cool, that sounds good. By the way, which stores? 
And they're like, oh, this one in Austin and all that. And he's like, great. Right. And he goes into his email tool and says like, email everyone within 50 miles of this location. Say, hey guys, I need a big favor. Like go buy as much, <laughs> you know, of That's our product cool. as possible. So he goes back and talks to the buyer at the, you know, at the grocery store. And he's like, hey, how, how'd the test go? It, it sold out. Like, and he's like, no, <laughs> amazing. Like, no way. People, people what? must love this. Right. So he gets national distribution on from there. So the company is called Primal Kitchen. And he built it, it took him two years great, great business. from launch to exit. He sold it to Kraft Foods for $200 million. And so if you look, he had a well-monetized audience, but that attention was worth infinitely more. And so we created, mm. you know, basically a hundred years of value in two years based on that. And so to your Apple hire question, I believe for most creators, there's a different business. There's a much yes. better way to monetize. And so if you can acquire those creators or hire them to build a software company, right? Should you sell digital courses or should you sell ConvertKit as a SaaS product, right? My, my lifetime value. We know is, SaaS is a better business SaaS model. SaaS is a better business model. We know that. <laughs> Isn't this the whole end game, which is like the creator moves up the value chain, right? So they start with courses and then to, to that person is there just like, well, I should just build a product, right? Like in B2B, Kip and I have talked about this for some time and B2B it is trickier, right? It's easier, I think, in consumer to like go build, a, go do the product than it is a lot of times in B2B because, you know, you're building software. A lot of creators do not know how to like build a software product. I'm starting to see it now. Like there was two founders I've talked to raising seed stage deals. Both of them started with audience. Like they had a newsletter. Someone else had another large audience and another channel. And they you, they got so much information from that. They're like, oh, there's a product in here. And then because they already had the audience, it was easier for them to like kickstart the product and start to get like feedback, make sure they were building it in the right way, have something like from day one, they've had people in their sphere using that product. And so it does feel like that's the kind of natural evolution of all this, which is like the smart creators just continue to move up the value chain and to build higher monetized products. Yeah, I think that's that's happening a lot, especially as you're getting all these examples of it, right? Where people are saying, you know, if I sell a product, that's actually worth more than selling attention. And you're seeing it at the highest levels with like, take Ryan Reynolds, for example, right? Early on getting paid to do TV commercials, he's getting paid I'll say a million dollars for a, a brand endorsement deal. And then at some point he realizes like, wait, this is actually worth more to you. Like this attention yeah. that I'm giving you is worth more yeah. than a million dollars. Yeah. Obviously, otherwise you wouldn't pay for it. You know, how much more is it worth? And so he eventually decides, okay, I'm going to buy into companies. I'm going to promote that, like own equity and then promote that myself. And, you know, the exits in uh, Mint Mobile for 1.3 billion and Aviation Gin for six or 700 million prove that his attention was wildly valuable i think i think the prime example of this now is what brian johnson's doing right you have brian johnson if folks aren't familiar he's the guy who's trying to live live forever he wants to live going well backwards to his 150 150 <laughs> 200 and but he's doing exactly what you both are saying right he invested all of this time and effort in like improving his health and he's basically just creating around it youtube TikTok. he's got a newsletter and then what did he get? He got a ton of feedback, just like the Primal Kitchen guy of like, oh man, you're right. Finding this olive oil that's really healthy is really hard. Oh, well, great guys. I'll just sell that olive oil. Oh, finding the right chocolate's really hard. I'll just sell you that chocolate, right? And it all comes down to one, you have such a big audience that you can find product market fit very clearly, right? You can, you can basically de-risk product market fit. And then Kieran, it came back to what you said, which is once you get once you have a big enough audience, you just get feedback really fast and you can iterate on a product and make your product better than anybody else's because you have those like really quick, really powerful feedback loops that are really hard when you're just, all right, I've got this product and I'm going to go out and talk to people about it and try to get them to use it. And over a year, I'll get enough feedback where it's like people like Brian Johnson can get the feedback they need in like a week instead of a year. You get to overcome this cold start problem, which most products yes. don't overcome. Like it might be a great product, but, or it might have the ability to iterate to become a great product, but it doesn't get to last long enough because it doesn't have, you know, enough early sales or momentum, or it doesn't get enough feedback, right? It doesn't get in front of enough people. I think you also touched on the difference between the, the creators of the brands that succeed long-term and the ones that don't. There's a lot of people uh, who look at celebrities who come out with a product and they're like, oh, I should do that too, right? The Rock has tequila. 
whoever else, like Lewis Hamilton, the F1. Like a thousand people have to kill it. Yeah, out, everybody like, has it, right? But I think the difference is that The Rock went in and like promoted it. Like, like he went all in on it. It wasn't like, oh, I have this t- attention. Let me pass them over there. And so what you're talking about is using that attention and really diving in and, and crafting the product, understanding how it's perceived and everything else. And that's the difference. Basically, we're going to see the trend continue. If someone's like, you know, basically throw away brands that they're building up and testing. And the ones that will be really successful are the ones who use their privileged position with an audience to get better information and better iterations than anyone else. By the way, if you're a creator, you still have to have a good business, Mm -hmm. right? Like if you look at uh, Hello Bello went bankrupt this week, right? So that's Kristen Bell and Dax Shepard. Two celebrities started this diaper company. And it turns, you know what it turns out? turns out it's really hard to make diapers. Like (laughs) I I saw a big breakdown of the bankruptcy and they're like, oh, Procter & Gamble has a $100 million machine to make their diapers because it's really (laughs) hard to manufacture, right? And so it's like, oh, well, cool. I'm glad you're passionate about your kids and passionate about diapers, but like it's actually really hard and really expensive. And part of where creators are going to fail is in not picking businesses that they can actually execute on for their audience and make a good product. It turns out there's two things to compete against, network effects and diaper making machines are your two moats as a company. (laughs) Actually, I don't think the end point is like moving up the value stack. I think maybe for maybe unfortunately, I think we're going to start to see the end point creators in in politics and presidents. And like you already see it happen in that like people who can use and wield these channels, they just have so much authority and ways to wield that power. But I suspect we, w- we won't yeah. just see creator led businesses, which we already do today. We're going to see like creator led politics. And I think that is going to be a wild and wacky and interesting world to live in. All right, Nathan, before we let you go. You work with the most successful creators in the world. What are what are a couple of your like top lessons from those creators? You've shared a lot in today's show, but if if, if folks are, are hanging with us to the end, what are a couple of things that you would say, hey, you, you got to keep these top of mind. You got to execute these things if you're going to be a great creator. Yeah, I think there's three things. First, you have to stick with it longer than most people would think is reasonable, right? You're going to see that trait yep. in, in SaaS and marketing, but it's especially true as a creator. And I think most creators who don't make it are the ones who gave up like a year in, a year and a half in, or they they focus on things sporadically. And so the people that I see get a lot of traction are showing up every single day for two years minimum. Like you're not even allowed to evaluate, is this worth doing until you've shown up every day for two years? The second thing is the best creators are finding a way to personalize their message First, to push content to their audience, and second, to personalize their message to specific members of their audience, right? And so that is really being able to segment through email, right? I'm going to capture as many subscribers as I can, and then I'm going to talk to them differently based on what they're interested in, what they've purchased from me, et cetera, right? As as B2B uh, business operators, we know this very, very well, right? You would not blast the same message to everyone at every stage in your like sales pipeline. And so don't do it when you're going B2C in the same way. And then I think the third thing is really thinking about what's the most valuable place that I can direct this attention. I mentioned Sahil Bloom before. He, I think, is the most fascinating creator because he is, in an undercover way, making an insane amount of money off of an audience. So on one hand, he's got a million followers on Twitter, 500,000 on his newsletter, and you're like, okay, so you can monetize that, you know, maybe $100,000 a month. If he did products, we could get that up higher. But what he's actually doing is he went through and he looked at, what am I spending money on as a creator? And he went down the list and he said, okay, I'm hiring. I've got a video editing agency. I've got an email marketing agency to help me with, you know, growth and putting out these lead magnets and, and all of that design, right? He's going through all these things to do all of, all of his cost centers as a creator. And he said, great, I'm going to start agencies for every single one of these. And so in the oh, last cool. well, 11 months, he has started eight agencies, many with the same operator, right? So he's hired people to do it. He provides all of the deal flow for this. He's partnered with other creators, right? So him, Sam Parr, and Cody Sanchez have an agency called Viral Cuts, which is making clips, Right. And these agencies are now at an $8 million a year run rate. They're all recurring revenue. They all use the same business model. And his whole thing is like, 
I have this attention. What can I point it to? And so if you click through, like we talked about, you know, in the social platforms, like a carousel works well on LinkedIn. So he's got a carousel about like eight mental models to think better about decision-making, whatever it is. If you flip through to the second to last slide, it's going to say, hey, why don't you, you know, if you enjoyed this content, sign up for my newsletter. That's the call to action we all expect. Then if you click to the very last slide, it says, and if you want to create designs like this, this is the agency that did it for me, which of course is one of his agencies. Of course he owns, yes. And so that like is insane monetization and every single agency that he operates has, they all have one problem. They have more leads than they can onboard, which has a virtuous cycle where the more someone can't have something, the more they want it. And so they're all like, he'd be at a $20 million a year run rate if he was comfortable scaling this up faster. But really he's saying like, no, I'm going to let leads sit in the pipeline. We're going to make sure we can crush it on execution from there. So I think that third lesson is really think hard about what is the most valuable thing that I can create, not just short-term cash flow, but like long-term enterprise value that I could direct this audience towards. Distribution is undefeated. <laughs> Distribution really is. is undefeated, everyone. <laughs> Never forget really it. Is. All right. This has been a creator deep dive. Please hit subscribe on YouTube if you loved this. Hit us up at a comment if you have feedback on today's show. It was so awesome to have you today, Nathan. And as always, we'll see everybody real soon on Marketing Against the Green. This data is wrong every freaking time. Have you heard of HubSpot? HubSpot is a CRM platform where everything is fully integrated. Whoa, I can see the client's whole history. Calls, support tickets, emails, and... Here's a task from three days ago I totally missed. HubSpot. Grow better. 